Welcome everybody to the PCS Green Forum. No to austerity and yes to one million climate jobs. We've tried to frame the agenda today to cover broadly the question of why the environment is a trade union issue, how we can take these issues up, how we can engage members, how we can bring these matters up at branches, in regions, and how we can make sure that the National Union reflects this issue as part of its campaigning alternative. I've just become a Green Rep in January of this year and uh, I'm sort of a bit short of ideas and you know it's hard to get going in the first instance especially because of the lack of time and facility time at work. Coming here is, is about getting information, it's about having facts and figures a bit more. Sometimes I want to argue the case but I don't know that I can always back it up with hard facts. Although you think you're alone with your issues, uh, there's, there are a lot of people you can share your concerns with. Social issues and environmental issues go hand in hand so much. But it's seen how the jigsaw pieces fit together Arming myself with information from days like today really helps. This is the first time I've come to this uh, kind of event. So it's more or less a learning experience for myself, but I can take back to my office. First of all, we look at getting our own house in order. We've got a network of offices, and it's always important to practice what you preach. Workplaces are responsible for over 50% of emissions. There should be statutory provision for workplace environmental reps. Millions of pounds is wasted by companies on energy costs. There are ways that we can save that. I think that's also important for members' pay terms and conditions, uh, also how we can stop jobs being cut. Well, our priority is really trying to save um, wastage and recycling locally in the office. I think that's somewhere to start um, a survey of members and non-members just to see what, what other things have uh, come up. I'm sure we could get some form of agreement with the London Transport to have a, a bit of a discount on our seasonal bus uh, travel. Learn a bit more about doing environmental audits because I've never actually done one in my own workplace. So that's definitely something I'm going to take away. Prisons use a huge amount of energy. For example, we have lots of small laundries all over the place when it may be greener to integrate those into a few larger units. We also of course, want to hold the government to account. One of the big successes of the previous government was the Climate Act. Even though it has its defects and it doesn't go far enough in many respects, that is a piece of legislation to which we need to hold politicians and the senior civil service to account. It's about establishing the bargaining machinery at a national level with government, with the Cabinet Office, and we want that replicated in every individual department. Now, the third strand, of course, is the wider campaigning dimension. PCS members are facing the biggest attack on their paid jobs and conditions in living memory. And there's a danger that the environment gets pushed down the agenda. The way to ensure that the environment is not lost amidst that battle is to make sure that it's central to our campaigning alternatives. One way that we've sought to reconcile those arguments is, of course, the production of the One Million Climate Jobs pamphlet. An initial investment of about 50 billion and then an annual investment of about 15 to 18 billion would be enough to create at least a million jobs. It looks at how the jobs could be created in refitting of homes, of insulation of homes and public buildings. We also look at the question of rebuilding the manufacturing sector in the UK economy through the development of a renewable industry. We also look at the question of a publicly owned sustainable transport system. In the aviation world the problem is posed the wrong way around as far as we as union members are concerned. It's a case of having an ever expanding industry first and then saying well what can we do to limit the environmental damage rather than saying how can we protect the environment first and then what aviation is it possible to sustain within that. An additional runway at Heathrow could reduce the amount of stack holding while actually making emissions far worse because of the increase in the absolute numbers of aircraft flying in and out of the airport. That doesn't even take into account other environmental impacts, the increase in noise for residents in the area and the destruction of the landscape involved in providing not only a landing strip but a terminal building and other facilities. Heathrow and Gatwick, thanks to the competitive tendering process, now have different owners. They could run competing flights to the same popular destinations and double up the amount of carbon emitted for essentially the same journey.
The idea that expanding Heathrow would create jobs for our members is a myth. In fact, if they can operate three runways with less people than they currently operate two, then that's the more likely scenario. For those working at the airport itself, jobs do increase with the size of the airport. However, it's not hard to predict that any expansion of the workforce would involve competitive tendering, outsourcing, private contractors, poor terms and conditions, zero hours contracts and so on. Other proposals have included second runways at Gatwick and Stansted or building whole new airports. If a Boris Island type airport were to be built, it would most likely have four runways and would render Heathrow redundant, including all the jobs and infrastructure that exist there. The Million Climate Jobs campaign, it does provide the basis for how we want to proceed, namely that we don't view jobs and the environment as opposing forces. Runway capacity at Heathrow and Gatwick can be better used, especially if we utilise space taken by flights that can be replaced by other modes of transport. If we factor in larger aircraft and more efficient fuels and engine types, then we can control the effects of the industry on our environment. And in providing jobs to enable those things to happen, we can protect our membership and help to re-stimulate the economy. We need to deal with the effects of climate change and we need to create jobs that will grow us out of austerity. The potential for indirect job creation just through the creation of a second rail network, a north-south uh, rail system, could actually create as many as a million jobs indirectly and at least 600,000 just actually working in that industry. We believe very simply that we need to get more people out of their cars, off of planes and onto trains. If you were to take a Eurostar train, say, from London, King's Cross, through to Paris, the level of carbon emissions it's a full 90% more efficient to actually take a train than a plane. So if you're able to turn up in a city centre, get on a train and arrive in another city centre and have a good connecting perhaps bus network to then take you out to the place you actually need to finally arrive, that is so, so much better in terms of cutting carbon emissions. One of the biggest areas for all carbon emission is actually through transport. I think it's almost as high as 90% if you add in lorries, transit, as well as planes. If we want to enable people to actually make a kind of modal shift into greener forms of transport, the way to do it is obviously having a much more intensely subsidised and developed public transport system. I pay you know, about a month and a half salary to, you know, to get my, my, my train ticket. My office is in central London and I, work, and I live in east London. I mean, that is just madness. In fact, what we're doing is we've created a system where we're subsidising private profit out of taxpayers' back pockets. East Coast Rail, by the time of the next general election, will have put nearly a billion pounds back into public exchequer. On the other side, you've got Richard Branson getting £300 million plus over a two or three year cycle. If we can actually bring those different elements together though, and we found that to be a very powerful argument with passengers, so we've actually managed to create an alliance between people working in the rail system, the people using the rail system, the passengers, and very clearly with environmental campaign groups, groups like Friends of the Earth, Climate Rush, have linked up with us to do everything from simple things where we're leafleting passengers, big online campaigns, right through to you know direct action. are concerned about climate change but also are more aware of the issue of climate change. Without a shadow of a doubt weather is becoming more extreme so we are dealing with more flooding incidents, we are dealing with more wildfire incidents, more forest fire incidents. There is no responsibility on the fire service to attend flooding incidents so you have to provide for flooding incidents from your existing resources. So obviously you start robbing Peter to pay Paul in order to attend flooding incidents in 2007, there was widespread flooding across the southwest, the Midlands, and the northeast. It required a coordinated response from across various brigades, something which wasn't really something that we did. There were 3,000 people rescued, countless properties were pumped out, efforts were made to prevent reservoirs flooding, saving the country massive amounts of money. 2012, in England and Wales, was the wettest summer on record. The year before, we responded to 13,000 flooding incidents. The year after, we responded to just under 23,000. The workload of the fire service as regards flooding incidents probably exceeded going to fires. At the moment, there are 900,000 homes at risk built on floodplains. That, is, that proposal is to increase that to between 1.5 million and 3.6 million uh, to, to 2050. 
In order to address that, they're reducing spending on flood prevention by 12%. And to further compound that, they're reducing the workforce in the Fire and Rescue Service by around about 20%. Adapting to increased flood risk is part of, the, uh, of tackling climate change and you have to invest in the fire service's ability to respond to those incidents more than ever before. The Forestry Commission has provided Great Britain with a verdant tapestry of woods and forests that have been enjoyed by the public since 1919. And the forest is the engine which is there to counter climate change. Public pressure in 2010-11 uh, stopped the planned disposal of England's public forest estate, the, the PFE. However, the government has slashed hundreds of jobs and closed seven regional offices since 2010. Now, following recommendations by the so-called independent panel, it established following its climb down. The UK government is working to break up the current Forestry Commission before the next election and replace the public forest estate with a new management organisation. It's a move condemned by the campaign group Save Our Woods who said, won't this make our forests even more vulnerable to political interference, asset squeezing and privatisation in the future? Our experience is that forestry and woodland focused objectives can be overwhelmed by the aims of a narrow focused organisation being involved. For example, it often leads to deforestation and loss of access, and this can endanger the sustainable, multi-purpose functioning of the forest. We also have concerns about further extensions of joint ventures and partnerships to run land driven by the need to raise money in a financially driven environment. The FC runs its land extremely efficiently at a considerably lower cost per hectare and at a huge benefit to the public compared to privately run forests which receive public money in the form of grants. The loss of an integrated, coherent forestry commission, underpinned by an internationally renowned scientific advice from forest research, jeopardises our ability to respond effectively to the challenge of climate change. We need your assistance in this endeavour. Show your support for all the FC staff and campaign alongside us in securing the long-term future of this much-respected organisation. <laughs> host of wider environmental issues that enable us to build up our campaign, yes, of opposition to the government, but part of it has obviously got to be our alternative. One of the updates that we're going to do in the Climate Jobs Pamphlet is look at the technical economic case for investment in wind and wave technology on the Lancashire coastline, in particular on the Fylde coast, bearing in mind the substantial plans for shale gas extraction drilling in Lancashire. It's going to be a very important battleground over the future of the energy industry. Planned originally in Balcombe, a little victory, it should be noted, in Balcombe. It's possible, another world is possible. Conventional fossil fuels like oil and gas, they're not as available as they were before. We've hit peaks in oil, we're approaching a peak in gas, and as you see, we're using so much more, there's a need to kind of go and find different ways of getting this energy. The tar sands or oil shell, you're having to do so many more things. Dig down really deep, form some process on it. It's a lot more energy we're putting in, and therefore, it tends to be a lot more expensive. As we're using so much more energy, this is also resulting in a lot more greenhouse gases being emitted, which means that we're really drastically affecting the planet. On fracking, um, we're against it because it's going to be a disaster for the environment, but also because it is the wrong solution for jobs and it's the wrong solution for a fair economy. So I think there's a real role for the trade union movement and green groups to come together. What you've got to try and do is to influence your MP or their party and your local council, well, to them, to oppose it. But also, perhaps quite crucially, is to get your local council to refuse permission for the drilling. Who are going to be your audience? Well, obviously your MPs. But quite clearly, you need to get your members educated about this to help you out. Your local council and your local community. Local branches putting forward motions, both the national conference or the group conferences. But also motions to your local trades council. 
public meetings to put your MP on the spot. You'll all remember the Make Your Vote Camp campaign where a lot of places had MPs on their stage. There's anti-franking groups all over the country. Work with them. See, go and see them, ask them what they need. Make sure that you build the widest possible campaign possible. In other words, you need to join up with your local trades councils, your local anti-cuts, your local green groups such as Friends of the Earth and so on. Bring down the big six! Bring down the big six! No more deaths from fuel poverty! No more deaths from fuel poverty! The other aspect is, of course, we've got to look at the consequences of the obscene profits of the six major energy companies and the consequences of fuel poverty. What percentage of fuel poor households consists of a single adult? Debts over 50%. Oh. By how much on average have energy bills increased over the past three years? 300. It is 300. An increase of 30% in three years or 10% a year. I'm quite keen to go back and maybe put the questionnaire out to members and then start maybe getting them, making more of a link between the cost of fuel and the effect of the low wages. It's surprising how widespread fuel poverty is as well within our members of our union. So I think we need to do a lot of work in getting people more involved and in campaigning against fuel poverty. You will have PCS members interviewing PCS members who are applying for help with fuel bills. There's a huge profits going on and linking with fracking as well, that is making that argument that, is, that this dash of gas and continual pursuit of fossil fuels is causing fuel poverty and climate change rather because they're so pissed against each other at the moment in the media that I think now is the absolute time to really take on that debate and win it. Bring down the big six! Bring down the big six! Bring down the big six! Pay your tax! Pay your tax! Pay your tax! One of the great successes of PCS, I would argue, is that we've put the question of tax avoidance right at the heart of the debate. The next phase of our tax justice campaign, linked to climate jobs, will be to look at questions of tax avoidance and tax evasion, 125 billion lost to the public purse, raising questions about the level of corporation tax, raising questions about the fact that the FTSE 100 companies are all recording record profit yields. Since the crash in 2008, the richest thousand people in Britain have seen their income increase to the tune of 185 billion. That is enough to pay off the entire UK budget deficit and they'd still pocket 40 billion. And in making the case for investment in renewables and making the case for an environmentally sound approach, we have to tackle these economic arguments as well. Be strong and don't give up. Change, change will happen, but nothing happens quickly. And we've just got to keep fighting and sticking together. The government really needs to be shook up.